Chapter Thirty Three, The Specksender. Concerning the officers of the whale craft, this seems as good a place as any to set down a little domestic peculiarity on shipboard arising from the existence of the harpooner class of officers, a class unknown, of course, in any other marine than the whale fleet. The large importance attached to the harpooner's vocation is evinced by the fact that originally, in the old Dutch fishery, two centuries or more ago, the command of a whale ship was not wholly lodged in the person now called the captain, but was divided between him and an officer called the specksender. Literally, this word means fat cutter. Usage, however, in time made it equivalent to chief harpooner. In those days, the captain's authority was restricted to the navigation and general management of the vessel, while over the whale-hunting department and all its concerns, the specksender or chief harpooner reigned supreme. In the British Greenland fishery, under the corrupted title of Spexioneer, this old Dutch official is still retained, but his former dignity is sadly abridged. At present he ranks simply as senior harpooner, and as such is but one of the captain's more inferior subalterns. Nevertheless, as upon good conduct of the harpooners the success of a whaling voyage largely depends, and since in the American fishery he is not only an important officer in the boat, but under certain circumstances, night watches on a whaling ground, the command of the ship's deck is also his, therefore the grand political maxim of the sea demands that he should nominally live apart from the men before the mast, and be in some way distinguished as their professional superior, though always by them familiarly regarded as their social equal. Now the grand distinction drawn between officer and man at sea is this, the first lives aft, the last forward. Hence, in whale-ships and merchantmen alike, the mates have their quarters with the captain, and so too, in most of the American whalers, the harpooners are lodged in the after part of the ship. That is to say, they take their meals in the captain's cabin, and sleep in a place indirectly communicating with it. Though the long period of a southern whaling voyage, by far the longest of all voyages now or ever made by man, the peculiar perils of it, and the community of interest prevailing among a company, all of whom, high or low, depend for their profits, not upon fixed wages, but upon their common luck, together with their common vigilance, intrepidity, and hard work, though all these things do, in some cases, tend to beget a less rigorous discipline than in merchantmen generally, yet never mind how much like an old Mesopotamian family these whalemen may, in some primitive instances, live together. For all that, the punctilious externals, at least, of the quarter-deck are seldom materially relaxed, and in no instance done away. Indeed, many are the Nantucket ships in which you will see the skipper parading his quarter-deck with an elated grandeur not surpassed in any military navy, nay, extorting almost as much outward homage as if he wore the imperial purple, not the shabbiest of pilot-cloth. And though of all men the moody captain of the Pequod was the least given to that sort of shallowest assumption, and though the only homage he ever exacted was implicit, instantaneous obedience, though he required no man to remove the shoes from his feet ere stepping upon the quarter-deck, and though there were times when, owing to peculiar circumstances connected with events hereafter to be detailed, he addressed them in unusual terms, whether of condescension or in terrorem or otherwise, yet even Captain Ahab was by no means unobservant of the paramount forms and usages of the sea. Nor, perhaps, will it fail to be eventually perceived that behind those forms and usages, as it were, he sometimes masked himself, incidentally making use of them for other and more private ends than they were legitimately intended to subserve. That certain sultanism of his brain, which had otherwise in good degree remained unmanifested, through those forms that same sultanism became incarnate in an irresistible dictatorship. For be a man's intellectual superiority what it will, 
It can never assume the practical, available supremacy over other men without the aid of some sort of external arts and entrenchments, always in themselves more or less paltry and base. This it is that forever keeps God's true princes of the empire from the world's hustings, and leaves the highest honors that this heir can give to those men who become famous more through their infinite inferiority to the choice hidden handful of the divine inert than through their undoubted superiority over the dead level of the mass. Such large virtue lurks in these small things when extreme political superstitions invest them, that in some royal instances even to idiot imbecility they have imparted potency. But when, as in the case of Nicholas the Tsar, the ringed crown of geographical empire encircles an imperial brain, then the plebeian herds crouch abased before the tremendous centralization. Nor will the tragic dramatist who would depict moral indomitableness in its fullest sweep and direct swing ever forget a hint incidentally so important in his art as the one now alluded to. But Ahab, my captain, still moves before me in all his Nantucket grimness and shagginess, and in this episode touching emperors and kings, I must not conceal that I have only to do with a poor old whale-hunter like him. And, therefore, all outward majestical trappings and housings are denied me. O oh, Ahab, what shall be grand in thee, it must needs be plucked at from the skies, and dived for in the deep, and featured in the unbodied air. Chapter 34 The Cabin Table It is noon, and Doughboy, the steward, thrusting his pale loaf-of-bread face from the cabin scuttle, announces dinner to his lord and master, who, sitting in the lee quarter-boat, has just been taking an observation of the sun, and is now mutely reckoning the latitude on the smooth, medallion-shaped tablet reserved for that daily purpose on the upper part of his ivory leg. From his complete inattention to the tidings, you would think that Moody Ahab had not heard his menial. But presently, catching hold of the mizzen shrouds, he swings himself to the deck, and in an even, unexhilarated voice, saying, Dinner, Mr. Starbuck, disappears into the cabin. When the last echo of his sultan's step has died away, and Starbuck, the first emir, has every reason to suppose that he is seated, then Starbuck rouses from his quietude, takes a few turns along the planks, and after a grave peep into the binnacle, says, with some touch of pleasantness, Dinner, Mr. Stubb, and descends the scuttle. The second emir lounges about the rigging a while, and then, slightly shaking the main brace to see whether it will be all right with that important rope, he likewise takes up the old burden, and, with a rapid, Dinner, Mr. Flask, follows after his predecessors. But the third emir, now seeing himself all alone on the quarter-deck, seems to feel relieved from some curious restraint, for tipping all sorts of knowing winks in all sorts of directions, and kicking off his shoes, he strikes into a sharp but noiseless squall of a hornpipe right over the Grand Turk's head, and then, by a dexterous slight, pitching his cap up into the mizzen-top for a shelf, he goes down rollicking, so far at least as he remains visible from the deck, reversing all other processions by bringing up the rear with music. But ere stepping into the cabin doorway below, he pauses, ships a new face altogether, and then, independent, hilarious little flask, enters King Ahab's presence, in the character of Abjectus, or the slave. It is not the least among these strange things, bred by the intense artificialness of sea usages, that while in the open air of the deck some officers will, upon provocation, bear themselves boldly and defyingly enough towards their commander, yet ten to one let those very officers the next moment go down to their customary dinner in that same commander's cabin, and straightway their inoffensive, not to say deprecatory and humble air towards him as he sits at the head of the table, this is marvellous, sometimes most comical. Wherefore this difference? A problem? Perhaps not. 
To have been Belshazzar, king of Babylon, and to have been Belshazzar not haughtily but courteously, therein certainly must have been some touch of mundane grandeur. But he who, in the rightly regal and intelligent spirit, presides over his own private dinner-table of invited guests, that man's unchallenged power and dominion of individual influence for a time, that man's royalty of state, transcends Belshazzar's, for Belshazzar was not the greatest. He who has but once dined his friends has tasted what it is to be Caesar. It is a witchery of social czarship which there is no withstanding. Now, if to this consideration you superadd the official supremacy of a shipmaster, then by inference you will derive the cause of that peculiarity of sea life just mentioned. Over his ivory inlaid table, Ahab presided like a mute, maned sea-lion on the white coral beach, surrounded by his warlike but still deferential cubs. In his own proper turn each officer waited to be served. They were as little children before Ahab, and yet in Ahab there seemed not to lurk the smallest social arrogance. With one mind their intent eyes all fastened upon the old man's knife, as he carved the chief dish before him. I do not suppose that for the world they would have profaned that moment with the slightest observation, even upon so neutral a topic as the weather. No. And when reaching out his knife and fork, between which the slice of beef was locked, Ahab thereby motioned Starbuck's plate towards him, the mate received his meat as though receiving alms, and cut it tenderly, and a little started if, perchance, the knife grazed against the plate, and chewed it noiselessly, and swallowed it not without circumspection. For, like the coronation banquet at Frankfurt, where the German emperor profoundly dines with the seven imperial electors, so these cabin meals were somehow solemn meals, eaten in awful silence, and yet, at table, old Ahab forbade not conversation. Only he himself was dumb. What a relief it was to choking stub when a rat made a sudden racket in the hold below. And poor little Flask, he was the youngest son, and little boy of this weary family party. His were the shin-bones of the saline beef, his would have been the drumsticks, for Flask to have presumed to help himself, this must have seemed to him tantamount to larceny in the first degree. Had he helped himself at that table, doubtless never more would he have been able to hold his head up in this honest world. Nevertheless, strange to say, Ahab never forbade him. And had Flask helped himself, the chances were Ahab had never so much as noticed it. Least of all did Flask presume to help himself to butter. Whether he thought the owners of the ship denied it to him, on account of its clotting his clear, sunny complexion, or whether he deemed that on so long a voyage in such marketless waters butter was at a premium, and therefore was not for him a subaltern, however it was, Flask, alas, was a butterless man. Another thing. Flask was the last person down at dinner, and Flask is the first man up. Consider— for hereby Flask's dinner was badly jammed in point of time. Starbuck and Stubb both had the start of him, and yet they also have the privilege of lounging in the rear. If Stubb even, who is but a peg higher than Flask, happens to have but a small appetite, and soon shows symptoms of concluding his repast, then Flask must bestir himself. He will not get more than three mouthfuls that day." for it is against holy usage for Stubb to proceed Flask to the deck. Therefore it was that Flask once admitted in private that ever since he had arisen to the dignity of an officer, from that moment he had never known what it was to be otherwise than hungry, more or less. For what he ate did not so much relieve his hunger as keep it immortal in him. Peace and satisfaction, thought Flask, have forever departed from my stomach. I am an officer, but how I wish I could fish a bit of old-fashioned beef in the forecastle as I used to when I was before the mast. There's the fruits of promotion now, there's the vanity of glory, there's the insanity of life. 
Besides, if it were so that any mere sailor of the Pequod had a grudge against Flask, in Flask's official capacity, all that sailor had to do in order to obtain ample vengeance was to go aft at dinner-time and get a peep at Flask through the cabin skylight, sitting silly and dumbfounded before awful Ahab. Now Ahab and his three mates formed what may be called the first table in the Pequod's cabin. After their departure, taking place in inverted order to their arrival, the canvas cloth was cleared, or rather was restored to some hurried order by the pallid steward, and then the three harpooners were bidden to the feast, they being its residuary legatees. They made a sort of temporary servants' hall of the high and mighty cabin. In strange contrast to the hardly tolerable constraint and nameless invisible domineerings of the captain's table was the entire carefree license and ease, the almost frantic democracy of those inferior fellows, the harpooners, while their masters, the mates, seemed afraid of the sound of the hinges of their own jaws, the harpooners chewed their food with such a relish that there was a report to it. They dined like lords. They filled their bellies like Indian ships all day loading with spices. Such portentous appetites had Queequeg and Tashtego that to fill out the vacancies made by the previous repast, often the pale doughboy was fain to bring on a great baron of salt junk seemingly quarried out of the solid ox. And if he were not lively about it, if he did not go with a nimble hop, skip, and a jump, then Tashtego had an ungentlemanly way of accelerating him by darting a fork at his back, harpoon-wise. And once Dagoo, seized with a sudden humor, assisted Doughboy's memory by snatching him up bodily, and thrusting his head into a great empty wooden trencher, while Tashtego, knife in hand, began laying out the circle preliminary to scalping him. He was naturally a very nervous, shuddering sort of little fellow, this bread-faced steward, the progeny of a bankrupt baker and a hospital nurse. And what with the standing spectacle of the black, terrific Ahab, and the periodical, tumultuous visitations of these three savages, Doughboy's whole life was one continual lip-quiver. Commonly, after seeing the harpooners furnished with all things they demanded, he would escape from their clutches into his little pantry adjoining, and fearfully peep out at them through the blinds of its door till all was over. It was a sight to see Queequeg seated over against Tashtego, opposing his filed teeth to the Indians. Crosswise to them, Dagoo seated on the floor, for a bench would have brought his hearse-plumed head to the low car lines, at every motion of his colossal limbs making the low cabin framework to shake, as when an African elephant goes passenger in a ship. But for all this, the great negro was wonderfully abstemious, not to say dainty, it seemed hardly possible that by such comparatively small mouthfuls he could keep up the vitality diffused through so broad, baronial, and superb a person. But, doubtless, this noble savage fed strong and drank deep of the abounding element of air, and through his dilated nostrils snuffed in the sublime life of the worlds. Not by beef or by bread are giants made or nourished. But Queequeg, he had a mortal, barbaric smack of the lip in eating, an ugly sound enough, so much so that the trembling doughboy almost looked to see whether any marks of teeth lurked in his own lean arms. And when he would hear Tashtego singing out for him to produce himself, that his bones might be picked, the simple-witted steward all but shattered the crockery hanging round him in the pantry by his sudden fits of the palsy, nor did the whetstone which the harpooners carried in their pockets for their lances and other weapons, and with which whetstones at dinner they would ostentatiously sharpen their knives, that grating sound did not at all tend to tranquilize poor Doughboy. How could he forget that, in his island days, Queequeg, for one, must certainly have been guilty of some murderous convivial indiscretions? Alas, Doughboy, hard fares the white waiter who waits upon cannibals, not a napkin should he carry on his arm but a buckler. In good time, though, to his great delight, the three salt-sea warriors would rise and depart, to his credulous, fable-mongering ears, all their martial bones jingling in them at every step, like Moorish scimitars in scabbards. 
But though these barbarians dined in the cabin, and nominally lived there, still, being anything but sedentary in their habits, they were scarcely ever in it except at meal-times, and just before sleeping-time when they passed through it to their own peculiar quarters. In this one matter Ahab seemed no exception to most American whale-captains, who, as a set, rather inclined to the opinion that by rights the ship's cabin belongs to them, and that it is by courtesy alone that anybody else is at any time permitted there. So that in real truth the mates and harpooners of the Pequod might more properly be said to have lived out of the cabin than in it. For when they did enter it, it was something as a street door enters a house, turning inwards for a moment only to be turned out the next, and as a permanent thing residing in the open air. Nor did they lose much hereby. In the cabin was no companionship. Socially, Ahab was inaccessible. Though nominally included in the census of Christendom, he was still alien to it. He lived in the world as the last of the grizzly bears lived in settled Missouri. And as when spring and summer had departed that wild Logan of the woods, burying himself in the hollow of a tree, lived out the winter there, sucking his own paws, so in his inclement, howling old age, Ahab's soul, shut up in the caved trunk of his body, there fed upon the sullen paws of its gloom. CHAPTER Thirty Five, THE MASTHEAD It was during the more pleasant weather that in due rotation with the other seamen my first masthead came round. In most American whalemen the mastheads are manned almost simultaneously with the vessels leaving her port, even though she may have fifteen thousand miles and more to sail ere reaching her proper cruising ground and if after a three four or five years voyage she is drawing nigh home with anything empty in her say an empty vial even then her mastheads are kept manned to the last and not till her skysail poles sail in amongst the spires of the port does she altogether relinquish the hope of capturing one whale more now as this business of standing mastheads ashore or afloat is a very ancient and interesting one let us in some measure expatiate here. I take it that the earliest standers of mastheads were the old Egyptians, because in all my researches I find none prior to them. For though their progenitors, the builders of Babel, must doubtless by their tower have intended to rear the loftiest masthead in all Asia or Africa either, yet, ere the final truck was put to it, as that great stone mast of theirs may be said to have gone by the board, in the dread gale of God's wrath, therefore we cannot give these Babel builders priority over the Egyptians, and that the Egyptians were a nation of masthead standers is an assertion based upon the general belief among archaeologists that the first pyramids were founded for astronomical purposes, a theory singularly supported by the peculiar stair-like formation of all four sides of those edifices, whereby, with prodigious long upliftings of their legs, those old astronomers were wont to mount to the apex, and sing out for new stars, even as the lookouts of a modern ship sing out for a sail, or a whale just bearing in sight. In St. Stylites, the famous Christian hermit of old times, who built him a lofty stone pillar in the desert, and spent the whole latter portion of his life on its summit, hoisting his food from the ground with a tackle, in him we have a remarkable instance of a dauntless stander of mastheads, who was not to be driven from his place by fogs or frosts, rain, hail, or sleet, but valiantly facing everything out to the last, literally died at his post. Of modern standers of mastheads we have but a lifeless set, mere stone, iron, and bronze men, who, though well capable of facing out a stiff gale, are entirely incompetent to the business of singing out upon discovering any strange sight. There is Napoleon, who, upon the top of the column of Vendôme, stands with arms folded, some one hundred and fifty feet in the air, careless now who rules the decks below, whether Louis Philippe, Louis Blanc, or Louis the Devil. Great Washington, too, stands high aloft on his towering mainmast in Baltimore, and like one of Hercules' pillars, his column marks that point of human grandeur beyond which few mortals will go. 
Admiral Nelson also on a capstan of gun metal stands his masthead in Trafalgar Square, and ever when most obscured by that London smoke, token is yet given that a hidden hero is there, for where there is smoke there must be fire. But neither great Washington, nor Napoleon, nor Nelson will answer a single hail from below, however madly invoked, to befriend by their counsels the distracted decks upon which they gaze, however it may be surmised that their spirits penetrate through the thick haze of the future, and descry what shoals and what rocks must be shunned. It may seem unwarrantable to couple in any respect the masthead standards of the land with those of the sea, but that in truth it is not so, is plainly evinced by an item for which Obed Macy, the sole historian of Nantucket, stands accountable. The worthy Obed tells us that in the early times of the whale fishery, ere ships were regularly launched in pursuit of the game, the people of that island erected lofty spars along the sea coast, to which the lookouts ascended by means of nailed cleats, something as fowls go upstairs in a hen house. A few years ago this same plan was adopted by the Bay Whalemen of New Zealand, who, upon descrying the game, gave notice to the ready-manned boats nigh the beach. But this custom has now become obsolete. Turn we, then, to the one proper masthead, that of a whale-ship at sea. The three mastheads are kept manned from sunrise to sunset, the seamen taking their regular turns, as at the helm, and relieving each other every two hours. In the serene weather of the tropics it is exceedingly pleasant, the masthead. Nay, to a dreamy, meditative man it is delightful. There you stand, a hundred feet above the silent decks, striding along the deep, as if the mass were gigantic stilts, while beneath you, and between your legs, as it were, swim the hugest monsters of the sea, even as ships once sailed between the boots of the famous Colossus at Old Rhodes. There you stand, lost in the infinite series of the sea, with nothing ruffled but the waves. The tranced ship indolently rolls, the drowsy trade winds blow, everything resolves you into a languor. For the most part, in this tropic whaling life, the sublime uneventfulness invests you. You hear no news, read no gazettes, extras with startling accounts of commonplaces never delude you into unnecessary excitements, you hear of no domestic afflictions, bankrupt securities, fall of stocks, are never troubled with the thought of what you shall have for dinner, for all your meals for three years and more are snugly stowed in casks, and your bill of fare is immutable. In one of those southern whalemen, on a long three or four years' voyage, as often happens, the sum of the various hours you spend at the masthead would amount to several entire months, and it is much to be deplored that the place to which you devote so considerable a portion of the whole term of your natural life should be so sadly destitute of anything approaching to a cosy inhabitiveness, or adapted to breed a comfortable localness of feeling, such as pertains to a bed, a hammock, a hearse, a sentry-box, a pulpit, a coach, or any other of those small and snug contrivances in which men temporarily isolate themselves. Your most usual point of perch is the head of the tagallant mast where you stand upon two thin parallel sticks, almost peculiar to whalemen, called the tagallant cross-trees. Here, tossed about by the sea, the beginner feels about as cosy as he would standing on a bull's horns. To be sure, in cold weather you may carry your house aloft with you in the shape of a watch-coat, but properly speaking the thickest watch-coat is no more of a house than the unclad body, for as the soul is glued inside of its fleshy tabernacle, and cannot freely move about in it, nor even move out of it without running great risk of perishing, like an ignorant pilgrim crossing the snowy Alps in winter, so a watch-coat is not so much of a house as it is a mere envelope, or additional skin encasing you, you cannot put a shelf or chest of drawers in your body, and no more can you make a convenient closet of your watch-coat. Concerning all this, it is much to be deplored that the mastheads of a southern whale-ship are unprovided with those enviable little tents or pulpits called crow's nests, in which the lookouts of a Greenland whaler are protected from the inclement weather of the frozen seas. 
in the fireside narrative of captain sleet entitled a voyage among the icebergs in quest of the greenland whale and incidentally for the rediscovery of the lost icelandic colonies of old greenland in this admirable volume all standards of mastheads are furnished with a charmingly circumstantial account of the then recently invented crow's nest of the glacier which was the name of captain sleet's good craft he called it the sleet's crow's nest in honor of himself he being the original inventor and patentee and free from all ridiculous false delicacy and holding that if we call our own children after our own names we fathers being the original inventors and patentees so likewise we should denominate after ourselves any other apparatus we may beget in shape the sleet's crow's nest is something like a large tierce or pipe it is open above however where it is furnished with a movable side screen to keep to windward of your head in a hard gale being fixed on the summit of the mast you ascend into it through a little trap hatch in the bottom on the after side or the side next to the stern of the ship is a comfortable seat with a locker underneath for umbrellas comforters and coats in front is a leather rack in which to keep your speaking trumpet pipe telescope and other nautical conveniences when captain sleet in person stood his masthead in this crow's nest of his he tells us that he always had a rifle with him also fixed in the rack together with a powder flask and shot for the purpose of popping off the stray narwhales or vagrant sea unicorns infesting those waters for you cannot successfully shoot at them from the deck owing to the resistance of the water but to shoot down upon them is a very different thing now it was plainly a labor of love for captain sleet to describe as he does all the little detailed conveniences of his crow's nest but though he so enlarges upon many of these and though he treats us to a very scientific account of his experiments in this crow's nest with a small compass he kept there for the purpose of counteracting the errors resulting from what is called the local attraction of all binnacle magnets an error ascribable to the horizontal vicinity of the iron in the ship's planks and in the glacier's case perhaps to there having been so many broken-down blacksmiths among her crew i say that though the captain is very discreet and scientific here yet for all his learned binnacle deviations azimuth compass observations and approximate errors he knows very well captain sleet that he was not so much immersed in those profound magnetic meditations as to fail being attracted occasionally towards that well-replenished little case-bottle so nicely tucked in on one side of his crow's nest within easy reach of his hand though upon the whole i greatly admire and even love the brave the honest and learned captain yet i take it very ill of him that he should so utterly ignore that case-bottle seeing what a faithful friend and comforter it must have been while with mittened fingers and hooded head he was studying the mathematics aloft there in that bird's nest within three or four perches of the pole but if we southern whale-fishers are not so snugly housed aloft as captain sleet and his greenlandmen were yet that disadvantage is greatly counterbalanced by the widely contrasting serenity of those seductive seas in which we south fishers mostly float for one i used to lounge up in the rigging very leisurely resting in the top to have a chat with queequeg or any one else off duty whom i might find there then ascending a little way further and throwing a lazy leg over the topsail yard take a preliminary view of the watery pastures and so at last mount to my ultimate destination let me make a clean breast of it here and frankly admit that i kept but sorry guard with the problem of the universe revolving in me how could i being left completely to myself at such a thought engendering altitude how could i but lightly hold my obligations to observe all whale ships standing orders keep your weather eye open and sing out every time and let me in this place movingly admonish you you shipowners of nantucket beware of enlisting in your vigilant fisheries any lad with lean brow and hollow eye given to unseasonable meditativeness and who offers to ship with the Phaedon instead of bowditch in his head beware of such a one i say your whales must be seen before they can be killed and this sunken-eyed young platonist will tow you ten wakes round the world and never make you one pint of sperm the richer 
nor are these monitions at all unneeded. For nowadays, the whale fishery furnishes an asylum for many romantic, melancholy, and absent minded young men, disgusted with the carking cares of earth and seeking sentiment in tar and blubber. Child Harrell not infrequently perches himself upon the masthead of some luckless, disappointed whale ship, and in moody phrase ejaculates, Roll on, thou deep, dark blue ocean, roll! Ten thousand blubber hunters sweep over thee in vain. Very often do the captains of such ships take those absent minded young philosophers to task, upbraiding them with not feeling sufficient interest in the voyage, half hinting that they are so hopelessly lost to all honourable ambition, as that in their secret souls they would rather not see whales than otherwise. But all in vain. Those young Platonists have a notion that their vision is imperfect. They are short-sighted. What use, then, to strain the visual nerve? They have left their opera glasses at home. "'Why, thou monkey,' said a harpooner to one of these lads, "'we've been cruising now hard upon three years, and thou hast not raised a whale yet. Whales are scarce as hen's teeth whenever thou art up here.' Perhaps they were." or perhaps there might have been shoals of them in the far horizon, but lulled into such an opium-like listlessness of vacant, unconscious reverie is this absent-minded youth by the blending cadence of waves with thoughts, that at last he loses his identity, takes the mystic ocean at his feet for the visible image of that deep, blue, bottomless soul pervading mankind and nature, and every strange, half-seen, gliding, beautiful thing that eludes him, every dimly discovered, uprising fin of some undiscernible form seems to him the embodiment of those elusive thoughts that only people the soul by continually flitting through it. In this enchanted mood, thy spirit ebbs away to whence it came, becomes diffused through time and space like Crammer's sprinkled pantheistic ashes, forming at last a part of every shore, the round globe over. There is no life in thee now except that rocking life imparted by a gently rolling ship, by her borrowed from the sea, by the sea from the inscrutable tides of God. But while this sleep, this dream is on you, move your foot or hand an inch, slip your hold at all, and your identity comes back in horror. Over Descartian vortices you hover, and perhaps at midday, in the fairest weather, with one half-throttled shriek you drop through that transparent air into the summer sea, no more to rise forever. Heed it well, you pantheists. Chapter 36 The Quarter Deck Enter Ahab, then all. It was not a great while after the affair of the pipe, that one morning, shortly after breakfast, Ahab, as was his wont, ascended the cabin gangway to the deck. There most sea captains usually walk at that hour as country gentlemen, after the same meal take a few turns in the garden. Soon his steady, ivory stride was heard, as to and fro he paced his old rounds, upon planks so familiar to his tread that they were all over dented like geological stones with the peculiar mark of his walk. Did you fixedly gaze, too, upon that ribbed and dented brow, there also you would see still stranger footprints, the footprints of his one unsleeping, ever-pacing thought. But on the occasion in question those dents looked deeper, even as his nervous step that morning left a deeper mark. And so full of his thought was Ahab that at every uniform turn that he made, now at the mainmast and now at the binnacle, you could almost see that thought turn in him as he turned, and pace in him as he paced, so completely possessing him indeed, that it all but seemed the inward mould of every outer movement. Do you mark him, Flask? whispered Stubb. The chick that's in him pecks the shell. T'will soon be out. The hours wore on. Ahab now shut up within his cabin, anon pacing the deck with the same intense bigotry of purpose in his aspect. It drew near the close of day. 
Suddenly he came to a halt by the bulwarks, and inserting his bone leg into the auger hole there, and with one hand grasping a shroud, he ordered Starbuck to send everybody aft. Sir, said the mate, astonished at an order seldom or never given on shipboard except in some extraordinary case. Send everybody aft, repeated Ahab. Mastheads there, come down. When the entire ship's company were assembled, and with curious and not wholly unapprehensive faces were eyeing him, for he looked not unlike the weather horizon when a storm is coming up, Ahab, after rapidly glancing over the bulwarks, and then darting his eyes among the crew, started from his standpoint, and, as though not a soul were nigh him, resumed his heavy turns upon the deck. With bent head and half-slouched hat he continued to pace, unmindful of the wondering whispering among the men, till Stubb cautiously whispered to Flask that Ahab must have summoned them there for the purpose of witnessing a pedestrian feat. But this did not last long. Vehemently pausing, he cried, "'What do you do when you see a whale, men?' "'Sing out for him,' was the impulsive rejoinder from a score of clubbed voices. "'Good!' cried Ahab, with a wild approval in his tones, observing the hearty animation into which his unexpected question had so magnetically thrown them. "'And what do you do next, men?' "'Lower away, and after him.' "'And what tune is it you pull to, men?' "'A dead whale or a stove-boat.' More and more strangely and fiercely, glad and approving, grew the countenance of the old man at every shout, while the mariners began to gaze curiously at each other, as if marvelling how it was that they themselves became so excited at such seemingly purposeless questions. But they were all eagerness again, as Ahab, now half revolving in his pivot-hole, with one hand reaching high up a shroud, and tightly, almost convulsively grasping it, addressed them thus. All ye mastheaders have before now heard me give orders about a white whale. Look ye, do you see this Spanish ounce of gold? Holding up a broad, bright coin to the sun. It is a sixteen-dollar piece, men. Do you see it? Mr. Starbuck, hand me yon top maul. While the mate was getting the hammer, Ahab, without speaking, was slowly rubbing the gold piece against the skirts of his jacket, as if to heighten its luster, and without using any words was meanwhile lowly humming to himself, producing a sound so strangely muffled and inarticulate that it seemed the mechanical humming of the wheels of his vitality in him. Receiving the top maul from Starbuck, he advanced towards the mainmast with the hammer uplifted in one hand, exhibiting the gold with the other, and with a high raised voice exclaiming, Whosoever of ye raises me a white-headed whale, with a wrinkled brow and a crooked jaw, whosoever of ye raises me that white-headed whale, with three holes punctured in his starboard fluke, look ye, whosoever of ye raises me that same white whale, he shall have this gold ounce, my boys. Huzzah! Huzzah! cried the seamen, as with swinging tarpaulins they hailed the act of nailing the gold to the mast. "'It's a white whale, I say,' resumed Ahab, as he threw down the top maul. "'A white whale. Skin your eyes for him, men. Look sharp for white water. If you see but a bubble, sing out!' All this while Tashtego, Dagoo, and Queequeg had looked on with even more intense interest and surprise than the rest— and at the mention of the wrinkled brow and crooked jaw, they had started as if each was separately touched by some specific recollection. "'Captain Ahab,' said Tashtego, "'that white whale must be the same that some call Moby Dick.' "'Moby Dick!' shouted Ahab. "'Do you know the white whale, then, Tash?' "'Does he fantail a little curious, sir, before he goes down?' said the gay-header, deliberately. "'And he has a curious spout, too,' said Dagoo. "'Very bushy, even for a parmacetti. "'And mighty quick, Captain Ahab. "'And he have one, two, three, oh! "'Good many iron in him hide, too, Captain. 
cried Queequeg disjointedly. "'All twisky tea, uh, be twisk like him, him!' faltering hard for a word, and screwing his hand round and round as though uncorking a bottle. "'Like him, him!' "'Corkscrew!' cried Ahab. "'Aye, Queequeg, the harpoons lie all twisted and wrenched in him. "'Aye, Dagoo, his spout is a big one, like a whole shock of wheat.' and white as a pile of our Nantucket wool after the great annual sheep-shearing. Aye, Tashtego, and he fantails like a split jib in a squall. Death and devils, men, it is Moby Dick you have seen. Moby Dick! Moby Dick! Captain Ahab, said Starbuck, who, with stub and flask, had thus far been eyeing his superior with increasing surprise, but at last seemed struck with a thought, which somewhat explained all the wonder. Captain Ahab, I have heard of Moby Dick, but it was not Moby Dick that took off thy leg. Who told thee that? cried Ahab, then pausing. Aye, Starbuck, aye, my hearties, all around. It was Moby Dick that dismasted me, Moby Dick that brought me to this dead stump I stand on now. Ay, ay! he shouted with a terrific, loud, animal sob, like that of a heart-stricken moose. Ay, ay! It was that accursed white whale that razied me, made a poor pegging lubber of me forever and a day. Then, tossing both arms with measureless imprecations, he shouted out, Ay, ay! And I'll chase him round good hope and round the horn, and round the Norway maelstrom, and round perdition's flames before I give him up. And this is what ye have shipped for, men, to chase that white whale on both sides of land, and over all sides of the earth, till he spouts black blood and rolls fin out. What say ye, men? Will ye splice hands on it now? I think ye do look brave." "'Aye, aye!' shouted the harpooners and the seamen, running closer to the excited old man. "'A sharp eye for the white whale! A sharp lance for Moby Dick!' "'God bless ye!' he seemed to half sob and half shout. "'God bless ye, men! Steward, go draw the great measure of grog! "'But what's this long face about, Mr. Starbuck? "'Wilt thou not chase the white whale?' Art not game for Moby Dick? I am game for his crooked jaw, and for the jaws of death, too, Captain Ahab, if it fairly come in the way of the business we follow. But I came here to hunt whales, not my commander's vengeance. How many barrels will thy vengeance yield thee, even if thou gettest it, Captain Ahab? It will not fetch thee much in our Nantucket market. Nantucket market! <laughs> But come closer, Starbuck. Thou requirest a little lower layer. If money's to be the measurer, man, and the accountants have computed their great counting-house the globe by girdling it with guineas, one to every three parts of an inch, then let me tell thee that my vengeance will fetch a great premium here. He smites his chest, whispered Stubb. What's that for? Methinks it rings most vast, but hollow. Vengeance on a dumb brute, cried Starbuck, that simply smote thee from blindest instinct. Madness! To be enraged with a dumb thing, Captain Ahab, seems blasphemous. Hark ye yet again, the little lower layer. All visible objects, man, are but as pasteboard masks. But in each event, in the living act, the undoubted deed, there some unknown but still reasoning thing puts forth the mouldings of its features from behind the unreasoning mask. If man will strike, strike through the mask! How can the prisoner reach outside except by thrusting through the wall? To me the white whale is that wall shoved near to me, Sometimes I think there's naught beyond, but tis enough. He tasks me, he heaps me, 
I see in him outrageous strength, but with an inscrutable malice sinewing it. That inscrutable thing is chiefly what I hate. And be the white whale agent, or be the white whale principal, I will wreak that hate upon him. Talk not to me of blasphemy, man. I'd strike the sun if it insulted me. For could the sun do that, then I could do the other, since there is ever a sort of fair play herein, jealousy presiding over all creations. But not my master man is even that fair play. Who's over me? Truth hath no confines. Take off thine eye, more intolerable than fiend's glarings as a doltish stare. So, so, thou reddenest and palest, my heat has melted thee to anger glow. But look ye, Starbuck, what is said in heat, that thing unsays itself. There are men from whom warm words are small indignity. I meant not to incense thee. Let it go. Look. See yonder Turkish cheeks of spotted tawn, living, breathing pictures painted by the sun. The pagan leopards, the unwrecking and unworshipping things that live and seek and give no reason for the torrid life they feel. The crew, man, the crew, are they not one and all with Ahab in this matter of the whale? See Stubb, he laughs. See yonder Chilean, he snorts to think of it. Stand up amidst the general hurricane, thy one tossed sapling cannot, Starbuck. And what is it? Reckon it. Tis but to help strike a fin, no wondrous feat for Starbuck. What is it more? From this one poor hunt, then, the best lance out of all Nantucket, surely he will not hang back, when every foremast hand has clutched a whetstone. Ah, constraining seize thee, I see, the billow lifts thee. Speak, but speak. Ay, ay, thy silence, then, that voices thee. Aside. Something shot from my dilated nostrils. He has inhaled it in his lungs. Starbuck now is mine, cannot oppose me now without rebellion. God keep me, keep us all, murmured Starbuck, lowly. But in his joy at the enchanted, tacit acquiescence of the mate, Ahab did not hear his foreboding invocation, nor yet the low laugh from the hold, nor yet the presaging vibrations of the winds in the cordage, nor yet the hollow flap of the sails against the mass, as for a moment their hearts sank in. For again Starbuck's downcast eyes lighted up with the stubbornness of life, the subterranean laugh died away, the winds blew on, the sails filled out, the ship heaved and rolled as before. Ah, ye admonitions and warnings, why stay ye not when ye come? But rather are ye predictions than warnings, ye shadows, yet not so much predictions from without as verifications of the foregoing things within. For with little external to constrain us, the innermost necessities of our being, these still drive us on. The measure! The measure! cried Ahab. Receiving the brimming pewter, and turning to the harpooners, he ordered them to produce their weapons. Then, ranging them before him near the capstan, with their harpoons in their hands, while his three mates stood at his side with their lances, and the rest of the ship's company formed a circle round the group, he stood for an instant searchingly eyeing every man of his crew. But those wild eyes met his, as the bloodshot eyes of the prairie wolves meet the eye of their leader, ere he rushes on at their head in the trail of the bison, but, alas, only to fall into the hidden snare of the Indian. "'Drink and pass!' he cried handing the heavy charged flagon to the nearest seaman. The crew alone now drink. Round with it, round. Short draughts, long swallows, men. Tis hot as Satan's hoof. So, so, it goes round excellently. It spiralizes in ye, forks out at the serpent's snapping eye. Well done, almost drained. That way it went, this way it comes. Hand at me. 
here's a hollow. Ha, <laughs> men, you seem the years. So brimming life is gulped and gone. Steward, refill. Attend now, my braves. I have mustered you round this capstan. And ye mates, flank me with your lances, and ye harpooners, stand there with your irons. And you, stout mariners, ring me in, that I may in some sort revive a noble custom of my fishermen fathers before me. O oh, men, you will yet see that, ha, boy, come back, bad pennies come not sooner. Hand it me. Why, now this pewter had run brimming again, wert not thou St. Vitus's imp. Away, thou ague! Advance, ye mates, cross your lances full before me. Well done. Let me touch the axis. So saying, with extended arm, he grasped the three level radiating lances at their cross centers, while so doing suddenly and nervously twitched them. Meanwhile, glancing intently from Starbuck to Stubb, from Stubb to Flask, it seemed as though by some nameless interior volition he would fain have shocked into them the same fiery emotion accumulated within the laden jar of his own magnetic life. The three mates quailed before his strong, sustained, and mystic aspect. Stubb and Flask looked sideways from him. The honest eye of Starbuck fell downright. "'In vain!' cried Ahab. "'But maybe tis well.' For did ye three but once take the full-forced shock, then mine own electric thing, that perhaps had expired from out me. Perchance, too, it would have dropped ye dead. Perchance ye need it not. Down, lances! And now, ye mates, I do appoint ye three cup-bearers to my three pagan kinsmen there. Yon three most honorable gentlemen and noblemen, my valiant harpooners, disdain the task? What, when the great Pope washes the feet of beggars, using his tiara for ewer? Oh, my sweet cardinals, your own condescension, that shall bend ye to it. I do not order ye, ye will it. Cut your seizings and draw the poles, ye harpooners. Silently obeying the order, the three harpooners now stood, with the detached iron part of their harpoons some three feet long, held barbs up before him. Stab me not with that keen steel. Cant them, cant them over. Know ye not the goblet end? Turn up the socket. So, so, now ye cup-bearers advance. The irons, take them, hold them while I fill. Forthwith, slowly going from one officer to the other, he brimmed the harpoon sockets with the fiery waters from the pewter. Now three to three ye stand. Commend the murderous chalices. Bestow them, ye who are now made parties to this indissoluble league. Ha! Starbuck! But the deed is done. Yon ratifying sun now waits to sit upon it. Drink, ye harpooners! Drink and swear, ye men that man the deathful whaleboat's bow. Death to Moby Dick! God hunt us all if we do not hunt Moby Dick to his death! The long, barbed steel goblets were lifted, and to cries and maledictions against the white whale, the spirits were simultaneously quaffed down with a hiss. Starbuck paled, and turned and shivered. Once more, and finally, the replenished pewter went the rounds among the frantic crew, when, waving his free hand to them, they all dispersed, and Ahab retired within his cabin. CHAPTER Thirty Seven. Sunset. The cabin, by the stern windows, Ahab sitting alone, and gazing out. I leave a white and turbid wake, pale waters, paler cheeks where'er I sail. The envious billows sidelong swell to whelm my track. Let them, but first I pass. Yonder, by the ever-brimming goblet's rim, the warm waves blush like wine. The gold brow plums the blue. The diver sun, slow dived from noon, goes down. My soul mounts up. She wearies with her endless hill. Is then the crown too heavy that I wear, this iron crown of Lombardy? 
yet it is bright with many a gem. I, the wearer, see not its far flashings, but darkly feel that I wear that that dazzlingly confounds. Tis iron, that I know, not gold. Tis split, too, that I feel. The jagged edge galls me so. My brain seems to beat against the solid metal. I steel skull mine, the sort that needs no helmet from the most brain-battering fight. Dry heat upon my brow. Oh, time was when as the sunrise nobly spurred me, so the sunset soothed. No more. This lovely light, it lights not me. All loveliness is anguish to me, since I can ne'er enjoy. Gifted with the high perception, I lack the low enjoying power. Damned most subtly and most malignantly. Damned in the midst of paradise. Good night. Good night. Waving his hand, he moves from the window. It was not so hard a task. I thought to find one stubborn at the least, but my one cogged circle fits into all their various wheels, and they revolve. Or, if you will, like so many ant hills of powder, they all stand before me, and I their match. Oh, hard! that to fire others the match itself must needs be wasting. What I've dared I've willed, and what I've willed I'll do. They think me mad. Starbuck does. But I'm demoniac. I am madness maddened. That wild madness that's only calm to comprehend itself. The prophecy was that I should be dismembered, and I, I lost this leg. I now prophesy that I will dismember my dismemberer. Now, then, be the prophet and the fulfiller one. That's more than ye, ye great gods, ever were. I laugh and hoot at ye, ye cricket players, ye pugilists, ye deaf burks and blinded bendigos. I will not say, as schoolboys do to bullies, take someone of your own size, don't pummel me. No. You've knocked me down, and I am up again, but ye have run and hidden. Come forth from behind your cotton bags. I have no long gun to reach ye. Come, Ahab's compliments to ye. Come and see if ye can swerve me. Swerve me? You cannot swerve me, else ye swerve yourselves. Man has ye there. Swerve me? The path to my fixed purpose is laid with iron rails, whereon my soul is grooved to run, over unsounded gorges, through the rifled hearts of mountains, under torrents' beds, unerringly I rush. Knots an obstacle, knots an angle to the iron way. Chapter 38 Dusk By the mainmast, Starbuck leaning against it. My soul is more than matched. She's overmanned, and by a madman. Insufferable sting that sanity should ground arms on such a field. But he drilled deep down and blasted all my reason out of me. I think I see his impious end, but feel that I must help him to it. Will I, nil I, the ineffable thing has tied me to him, toes me with a cable I have no knife to cut. Horrible old man! Who's over him, he cries. Aye, he would be a democrat to all above. Look how he lords it over all below. Oh, I plainly see my miserable office, to obey rebelling, and worse yet, to hate with a touch of pity. For in his eyes I read some lurid woe would shrivel me up, had I it. Yet is there hope, time and tide flow wide. The hated whale has the round, watery world to swim in, as the small goldfish has its glassy globe. His heaven-insulting purpose God may wedge aside. I would up heart, were it not like lead. But my whole clock's run down, my heart the all-controlling weight, I have no key to lift again. A burst of revelry from the forecastle. Oh, God! God, to sail with such a heathen crew that have small touch of human mothers in them, 
whelped somewhere by the sharkish sea. The white whale is their demi-gorgon. Hark! The infernal orgies! That revelry is forward. Mark the unfaltering silence aft. Methinks it pictures life. Foremost through the sparkling sea shoots the gay, embattled, bantering bow, but only to drag dark Ahab after it, where he broods within his sternward cabin, builded over the dead water of the wake, and further on hunted by its wolfish gurglings. The long howl thrills me through. Peace, ye revellers, and set the watch. Oh, life, tis an hour like this, with soul beat down and held to knowledge, as wild, untutored things are forced to feed. Oh, life, tis now that I do feel the latent horror in thee. But tis not me. That horror's out of me. And with the soft feeling of the human in me, yet I will try to fight ye, ye grim phantom futures. Stand by me. Hold me. Bind me, O oh, ye blessed influences. Chapter 39 First Night Watch, Foretop. Stub, Solace, and Mending a Brace. Ha! 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 Ahem! Clear my throat. I've been thinking over it ever since, and that ha-ha's the final consequence. Why so? Because a laugh's the wisest, easiest answer to all that's queer, and come what will, one's comfort's always left. That unfailing comfort is. It's all predestinated. I heard not all his talk with Starbuck, but to my poor eye Starbuck then looked something as I the other evening felt. <laughs> Be sure the old mogul had fixed him, too. I twigged it, knew it, had had the gift, might readily have prophesied it, for when I clapped my eye upon his skull I saw it. Well, Stubb, wise Stubb, that's my title. Well, Stubb, what of it, Stubb? Here's a carcass. I know not all that may be coming, but be it what it will, I'll go to it laughing. Such a waggish leering as lurks in all your horribles. I feel funny. Fala, lira, skira. What's my juicy little pear at home doing now? Crying its eyes out? <laughs> Giving a party to the last arrived harpooners, I dare say. Gay as a frigate's pennant, and so am I. Fala, lira, skira. Oh! We'll drink to-night, with hearts as light, to love as gay as fleeting, as bubbles that swim on beaker's brim, and break on the lips while meeting. A brave stave, that. Who calls? Mr. Starbuck. Aye, aye, sir. Aside. He's my superior. He has his, too, if I'm not mistaken. Aye, aye, sir. Just through with this job. Coming. Chapter 40. Midnight. Foxal. Harpooners and sailors. Foresail rises and discovers the watch standing, lounging, leaning, and lying in various attitudes, all singing in chorus. Farewell and adieu to you, Spanish ladies. Farewell and adieu to you, ladies of Spain. Our captains commanded. First Nantucket sailor. Oh, boys, don't be sentimental. It's bad for the digestion. Take a tonic and follow me. Sings, and all follow. Our captain stood upon the deck, a spyglass in his hand, a viewing of those gallant whales that blew at every strand. Oh, your tubs and your boats, my boys, and by your braces stand, and we'll have one of those fine whales, hand, boys, overhand. So be cheery, my lads, may your hearts never fail, while the bold harpooner is striking the whale. Mate's voice from the quarter-deck. Eight bells there, forward. Second Nantucket sailor. Avast the chorus! Eight bells there! Do you hear, bell-boy? Strike the bell eight, thou pip, thou blackling, and let me call the watch. I've the sort of mouth for that, the hogshead mouth. So, so, thrusts his head down the scuttle. Starboleens, ahoy! Eight bells there below! Tumble up! Dutch sailor. Grand snoozing to-night, matey, fat night for that. I mark this in our old mogul's wine. It's quite deadening to some as filliping to others. We sing, they sleep. I lie down there like ground tear butts. At em again. There, take this copper pump and hail em through it. Tell em to a vast dreaming of their lasses. 
tell them it's the resurrection that they must kiss their last and come to judgment that's the way that's it thy throat ain't spoiled with eating amsterdam butter french sailor hist boys let us have a jig or two before we ride to anchor in blanket bay what say ye there comes the other watch stand by all legs pip little pip hurrah with your tambourine pip sulky and sleepy don't know where it is french sailor beat thy belly then and wag thy ears jig it men i say marries the word hurrah damn me won't you dance form now indian file and gallop into the double shuffle throw yourselves legs legs iceland sailor i don't like your floor matey it's too springy to my taste i'm used to ice floors i'm sorry to throw cold water on the subject but excuse me maltese sailor me too where's your girls who but a fool would take his left hand by his right and say to himself how do you do partners i must have partners sicilian sailor ay girls and a green then i'll hop with ye yea turn grasshopper long island sailor well well ye sulkies there's plenty more of us ho corn when ye may say i all legs go to harvest soon ah here comes the music now for it azor sailor ascending and pitching the tambourine up the scuttle here you are pip and there's the windless bits up you mount now boys the half of them dance to the tambourine some go below some sleep or lie among the coils of rigging oaths aplenty azor sailor dancing go to it pip bang it bell-boy rig it dig it stig it quig it bell-boy make fireflies break the jinglers pip jinglers you say there goes another dropped off i pound it so china sailor rattle thy teeth then and pound away make a pagoda of thyself french sailor merry mad hold up thy hoop pip till i jump through it split jibs tear yourselves tashtego quietly smoking that's the white man he calls that fun humph i save my sweat old manx sailor i wonder whether those jolly lads bethink them of what they are dancing over i'll dance over your grave i will that's the bitterest threat of your night women that beat headwinds round corners oh christ to think of the green navies and the green skulled crew well well be like the whole world's a ball as you scholars have it and so tis right to make one ballroom of it dance on lads you're young I was once. Third Nantucket Sailor. Spell! Oh, whew! This is worse than pulling after whales in a calm. Give us a whiff, Tash. They cease dancing and gather in clusters. Meantime the sky darkens, the wind rises. Lascar Sailor. By Brahma, boys, it'll douse sail soon. The sky-born, high-tide Ganges turned to wind. Thou showest thy black brow, Siva maltese sailor reclining and shaking his cap it's the waves the snow-caps turn to jig it now they'll shake their tassels soon now would all the waves were women then i'd go drown and chassis with them evermore there's naught so sweet on earth heaven may not match it as those swift glances of warm wild bosoms in the dance when the over-arboring arms hide such ripe bursting grapes Sicilian sailor, reclining. Tell me not of it. Hark ye, lad. Fleet interlacings of the limbs, lithe swayings, coyings, flutterings, lip, heart, hip, all graze, unceasing touch and go. Not taste, observe ye, else come satiety. Eh, pagan? Nudging. Tahitian sailor, reclining on a mat. Hail, holy nakedness of our dancing girls, the heva heva! Ah, low veiled, high palm Tahiti! I still rest me on thy mat, but the soft soil has slid. I saw thee woven in the wood, my mat, green the first day I brought ye thence, now worn and wilted quite. 
Ah, me! Not thou nor I can bear the change. How then, if so be transplanted to yon sky? Hear I the roaring streams from Pirohiti's peak of spears when they leap down the crags and drown the villages? The blast! The blast! Up, spine, and meet it! Leaps to his feet. Portuguese sailor. How the sea rolls, swashing against the side. Stand by for reefing, hearties. The winds are just crossing swords. Pell-mell they go lunging presently. Danish sailor. Crack, crack, old ship. So long as thou crackest, thou holdest. Well done. The mate there holds ye to it stiffly. He's no more afraid than the isle fort at Kattegat, put there to fight the Baltic with storm-lashed guns, on which the sea-salt cakes. Fourth Nantucket sailor. He has his orders, mind ye that. I heard old Ahab tell him he must always kill a squall, something as they burst a water-spout with a pistol. Fire your ship right into it. English sailor. Blood! But that old man's a grand old cove. We are the lads to hunt him up his whale. All. Aye, aye! Old Manx sailor. How the three pines shake! Pines are the hardest sort of tree to live when shifted to any other soil. And here there's none but the crew's cursed clay. Steady, helmsman, steady. This is the sort of weather when brave hearts snap ashore, and keeled hulls split at sea. Our captain has his birthmark. Look yonder, boys, there's another in the sky. Lurid-like, you see, all else pitch black. Dagoo. What of that? Who's afraid of black's afraid of me? I'm quarried out of it. Spanish sailor. Aside. He wants to bully, eh? The old grudge makes me touchy. Advancing. Ay, harpooner, thy race is the undeniable dark side of mankind, devilish dark at that. No offense. Dagoo grimly. None. St. Jago's sailor. That Spaniard's mad or drunk, but that can't be, or else in his one case our old mogul's firewaters are somewhat long in working. Fifth Nantucket sailor. What's that I saw? Lightning? Yes. Spanish sailor. No. Dagoo showing his teeth. Dagoo springing. Swallow thine, mannequin. White skin, white liver. Spanish sailor, meeting him. Knife thee hardly, big frame, small spirit. All. A row, a row, a row. Tashtego, with a whiff. A row alow and a row aloft. Gods and men, both brawlers. Humph. <laughs> Belfast sailor. A row, a row, a row. The virgin be blessed, a row. Plunge in with ye. English sailor. Fair play. Snatch the Spaniard's knife. A ring, a ring. Old Manx sailor. Ready formed. There, the ringed horizon. In that ring Cain struck Abel. Sweet work, right work, no? Why, then, God, mates thou the ring? Mate's voice from the quarter-deck. Hands by the halyards, in topgallant sails. Stand by to reef topsails. All. The squall, the squall, jump, my jollies. They scatter. Pip, shrinking under the windlass. Jollies? Lord, help such jollies. Crish, crash, there goes the jib-stay. Blang, wang. God, duck lower, Pip. Here comes the royal yard. It's worse than being in the world woods the last day of the year. Who'd go climbing after chestnuts now? But there they go, all cursing. And here I don't. Fine prospects to em. There on the road to heaven. Hold on hard. Jiminy, what a squall! But those chaps are worse yet. They are your white squalls, they. White squalls? White whale? Sure, sure. Here have I heard all their chat just now. And the white whale? Sure, sure. But spoken of once, and only this evening, it makes me jingle all over like my tambourine. That anaconda of an old man swore him in to hunt him. Oh, thou big white god aloft there somewhere in yon darkness, have mercy on this small black boy down here. Preserve him from all men that have no bowels to feel fear. 
Chapter Forty One, Moby Dick. I, Ishmael, was one of that crew. My shouts had gone up with the rest. My oath had been welded with theirs. And stronger I shouted, and more did I hammer and clinch my oath, because of the dread in my soul. A wild, mystical, sympathetical feeling was in me. Ahab's quenchless feud seemed mine. With greedy ears I learned the history of that murderous monster against whom I and all the others had taken our oaths of violence and revenge. For some time past, though at intervals only, the unaccompanied, secluded white whale had haunted those uncivilized seas mostly frequented by the sperm whale fishermen. But not all of them knew of his existence. Only a few of them, comparatively, had knowingly seen him, while the number who as yet had actually and knowingly given battle to him was small indeed. For, owing to the large number of whale cruisers, the disorderly way they were sprinkled over the entire watery circumference, many of them adventurously pushing their quest along solitary latitudes, so as seldom or never for a whole twelve month or more on a stretch to encounter a single news-telling sail of any sort, the inordinate length of each separate voyage, the irregularity of the times of sailing from home, all these, with other circumstances, direct and indirect, long obstructed the spread through the whole world-wide whaling fleet of the special individualizing tidings concerning Moby Dick. It was hardly to be doubted that several vessels reported to have encountered, at such or such a time, or on such or such a meridian, a sperm whale of uncommon magnitude and malignity, which whale, after doing great mischief to his assailants, had completely escaped them. To some minds it was not an unfair presumption, I say, that the whale in question must have been no other than Moby Dick. Yet, as of late, the sperm whale fishery had been marked by various and not unfrequent instances of great ferocity, cunning, and malice in the monster attacked. Therefore it was that those who, by accident, ignorantly gave battle to Moby Dick, such hunters, perhaps, for the most part, were content to ascribe the peculiar terror he bred more, as it were, to the perils of the sperm whale fishery at large than to the individual cause. In that way, mostly, the disastrous encounter between Ahab and the whale had hitherto been popularly regarded. And as for those who previously hearing of the white whale by chance caught sight of him, in the beginning of the thing they had every one of them almost as boldly and fearlessly lowered for him as for any other whale of that species. But at length such calamities did ensue in these assaults, not restricted to sprained wrists and ankles, broken limbs, or devouring amputations, but fatal to the last degree of fatality, those repeated disastrous repulses all accumulating and piling their terrors upon Moby Dick, those things had gone far to shake the fortitude of many brave hunters to whom the story of the white whale had eventually come. Nor did wild rumors of all sorts fail to exaggerate, and still the more horrify the true histories of these deadly encounters, for not only do fabulous rumors naturally grow out of the very body of all surprising terrible events, as the smitten tree gives birth to its fungi, but in maritime life, far more than in that of terra firma, wild rumors abound, wherever there is any adequate reality for them to cling to, and as the sea surpasses the land in this matter, so the whale fishery surpasses every other sort of maritime life, in the wonderfulness and fearfulness of the rumors which sometimes circulate there. For not only are whalemen as a body unexempt from that ignorance and superstitiousness hereditary to all sailors, but of all sailors they are, by all odds, the most directly brought into contact with whatever is appallingly astonishing in the sea. Face to face they not only eye its greatest marvels, but hand to jaw give battle to them, alone in such remotest waters that though you sailed a thousand miles and passed a thousand shores, you would not come to any chiselled hearthstone, or aught hospitable beneath that part of the sun, 
in such latitudes and longitudes, pursuing too such a calling as he does, the whaleman is wrapped by influences all tending to make his fancy pregnant with many a mighty birth. No wonder, then, that ever-gathering volume from the mere transit over the widest watery spaces, the outblown rumors of the white whale did in the end incorporate with themselves all manner of morbid hints and half-formed fetal suggestions of supernatural agencies which eventually invested Moby Dick with new terrors unborrowed from anything that visibly appears, so that in many cases such a panic did he finally strike that few who by those rumours at least had heard of the white whale, few of those hunters were willing to encounter the perils of his jaw. But there were still other and more vital practical influences at work. Not even at the present day has the original prestige of the sperm whale, as fearfully distinguished from all other species of the leviathan, died out in the minds of the whalemen as a body. There are those this day among them who, though intelligent and courageous enough in offering battle to the Greenland or right whale, would perhaps, either from professional inexperience or incompetency or timidity, decline a contest with the sperm whale. At any rate, there are plenty of whalemen, especially among those whaling nations not sailing under the American flag, who have never hostilely encountered the sperm whale, but whose sole knowledge of the leviathan is restricted to the ignoble monster primitively pursued in the north. Seated on their hatches, these men will hearken with a childish fireside interest and awe to the wild, strange tales of southern whaling. Nor is the preeminent tremendousness of the great sperm whale anywhere more feelingly comprehended than on board of those prows which stem him and as if the now tested reality of his might had in former legendary times thrown its shadow before it, we find some book naturalists, Olison and Povelson, declaring the sperm whale not only to be a consternation to every other creature in the sea, but also to be so incredibly ferocious as continually to be a thirst for human blood nor even down to so late a time as Cuvier's were these or almost similar impressions effaced. For in his natural history the baron himself affirms that at sight of the sperm whale all fish, sharks included, are struck with the most lively terrors, and often in the precipitancy of their flight dash themselves against the rocks with such violence as to cause instantaneous death and however the general experiences in the fishery may amend such reports as these, yet in their full terribleness, even to the bloodthirsty item of Povelson, the superstitious belief in them is, in some vicissitudes of their vocation, revived in the minds of the hunters. So that, overawed by the rumours and portents concerning him, not a few of the fishermen recalled, in reference to Moby Dick, the earlier days of the sperm whale fishery, when it was oftentimes hard to induce long-practiced right whalemen to embark in the perils of this new and daring warfare, such men protesting that, although other leviathans might be hopefully pursued, yet to chase and point lance at such an apparition as the sperm whale was not for mortal man, that to attempt it would be inevitably to be torn into a quick eternity. On this head there are some remarkable documents that may be consulted. Nevertheless, some there were who, even in the face of these things, were ready to give chase to Moby Dick, and a still greater number who, chancing only to hear of him distantly and vaguely, without the specific details of any certain calamity, and without superstitious accompaniments, were sufficiently hardy not to flee from the battle if offered. One of the wild suggestions referred to, as at last coming to be linked with the white whale in the minds of these superstitiously inclined, was the unearthly conceit that Moby Dick was ubiquitous, that he had actually been encountered in opposite latitudes at one and the same instant of time. Nor, credulous as such minds might have been, was this conceit altogether without some faint show of superstitious probability for as the secrets of the currents of the seas have never yet been divulged even to the most erudite research 
so the hidden ways of the sperm whale when beneath the surface remain in great part unaccountable to his pursuers and from time to time have originated the most curious and contradictory speculations regarding them especially concerning the mystic modes whereby after sounding to a great depth he transports himself with such vast swiftness to the most widely distant points it is a thing well known to both american and english whale ships and as well a thing placed upon authoritative record years ago by scoresby that some whales have been captured far north in the pacific in whose bodies have been found the barbs of harpoons darted in the greenland seas nor is it to be gainsaid that in some of these instances it has been declared that the interval of time between the two assaults could not have exceeded very many days hence by inference it has been believed by some whalemen that the northwest passage so long a problem to man was never a problem to the whale so that here in the real living experience of living men the prodigies related in old times of the inland strelo mountain in portugal near whose top there was said to be a lake in which the wrecks of ships floated up to the surface and that still more wonderful story of the Arethusa fountain near Syracuse, whose waters were believed to have come from the Holy Land by an underground passage, these fabulous narrations are almost fully equalled by the realities of the whalemen. Forced into familiarity, then, with such prodigies as these, and knowing that after repeated intrepid assaults the white whale had escaped alive, it cannot be much matter of surprise that some whalemen should go still further in their superstitions declaring moby dick not only ubiquitous but immortal for immortality is but ubiquity in time that though groves of spears should be planted in his flanks he would still swim away unharmed or if indeed he should ever be made to spout thick blood such a sight would be but a ghastly deception for again in unsanguined billows hundreds of leagues away his unsullied jet would once more be seen but even stripped of these supernatural surmisings there was enough in the earthly make and incontestable character of the monster to strike the imagination with unwonted power for it was not so much his uncommon bulk that so much distinguished him from other sperm whales but as elsewhere thrown out a peculiar snow-white wrinkled forehead and a high pyramidical white hump these were his prominent features the tokens whereby even in the limitless uncharted seas he revealed his identity at a long distance to those who knew him the rest of his body was so streaked and spotted and marbled with the same shrouded hue that in the end he had gained his distinctive appellation of the white whale a name indeed literally justified by his vivid aspect when seen gliding at high noon through a dark blue sea leaving a milky way wake of creamy foam all spangled with golden gleamings nor was it his unwonted magnitude nor his remarkable hue nor yet his deformed lower jaw that so much invested the whale with natural terror as that unexampled intelligent malignity which according to specific accounts he had over and over again evinced in his assaults more than all his treacherous retreats struck more dismay than perhaps aught else for when swimming before his exulting pursuers with every apparent symptom of alarm he had several times been known to turn round suddenly and bearing down upon them either stave their boats to splinters or drive them back in consternation to their ship already several fatalities had attended his chase but those similar disasters however little bruited ashore were by no means unusual in the fishery yet in most instances such seemed the white whale's infernal aforethought of ferocity that every dismembering or death that he caused was not wholly regarded as having been inflicted by an unintelligent agent judge then to what pitches of inflamed distracted fury the minds of his more desperate hunters were impelled when amid the chips of chewed boats and the sinking limbs of torn comrades they swam out of the white curds of the whale's direful wrath into the serene exasperating sunlight that smiled on 
as if at a birth or a bridal. His three boats stove around him, and oars and men both whirling in the eddies, one captain, seizing the line-knife from his broken prow, had dashed at the whale, as an Arkansas duelist at his foe, blindly seeking with a six-inch blade to reach the fathom-deep life of the whale. That captain was Ahab, and then it was that, suddenly sweeping his sickle-shaped lower jaw beneath him, Moby Dick had reaped away Ahab's leg, as a mower a blade of grass in the field. No turban Turk, no hired Venetian or Malay, could have smote him with more seeming malice. Small reason was there to doubt, then, that ever since that almost fatal encounter, Ahab had cherished a wild vindictiveness against the whale. All the more fell, for that in his frantic morbidness he at last came to identify with him not only all his bodily woes, but all his intellectual and spiritual exasperations. The white whale swam before him as the monomaniac incarnation of all those malicious agencies which some deep men feel eating in them, till they are left living on with half a heart and half a lung. That intangible malignity which has been from the beginning, to whose dominion even the modern Christians ascribe one half of the worlds, which the ancient Ophites of the East reverenced in their statue devil, Ahab did not fall down and worship it like them, but deliriously transferring its ideas to the abhorred white whale, he pitted himself all mutilated against it. All that most maddens and torments, all that stirs up the lees of things, all truth with malice in it, all that cracks the sinews and cakes the brain, all the subtle demonisms of life and thought, all evil to crazy Ahab, were visibly personified and made practically assailable in Moby Dick. He piled upon the white whale's hump the sum of all the general rage and hate felt by his whole race from Adam down, and then, as if his chest had been a mortar, he burst his hot heart's shell upon it. It is not probable that this monomania in him took its instant rise at the precise time of his bodily dismemberment. Then, in darting at the monster, knife in hand, he had but given loose to a sudden, passionate, corporal animosity, and when he received the stroke that tore him, he probably but felt the agonizing bodily laceration, but nothing more. Yet when by this collision forced to turn towards home, and for long months of days and weeks Ahab and Anguish lay stretched together in one hammock, rounding in midwinter that dreary howling Patagonian cape, then it was that his torn body and gashed soul bled into one another, and so interfusing made him mad that it was only then, on the homeward voyage, after the encounter, that the final monomania seized him, seems all but certain from the fact that, at intervals during the passage, he was a raving lunatic, and, though unlimbed of a leg, yet such vital strength yet lurked in his Egyptian chest, and was moreover intensified by his delirium, that his mates were forced to lace him fast, even there as he sailed, raving in his hammock, in a straitjacket he swung to the mad rockings of the gales, and when running into more sufferable latitudes the ship, with mild stunsails spread, floated across the tranquil tropics, and to all appearances the old man's delirium seemed left behind him with the Cape Horn swells, and he came forth from his dark den into the blessed light and air, even then when he bore that firm collected front, however pale, and issued his calm orders once again, and his mates thanked God the direful madness was now gone, even then Ahab, in his hidden self, raved on. Human madness is oftentimes a cunning and most feline thing. When you think it fled, it may have but become transfigured into some still subtler form. Ahab's full lunacy subsided not, but deepeningly contracted, like the unabated Hudson, when that noble Northman flows narrowly but unfathomably through the highland gorge. But as in his narrow flowing monomania not one jot of Ahab's broad madness had been left behind, 
so in that broad madness not one jot of his great natural intellect had perished that before living agent now became the living instrument if such a furious trope may stand his special lunacy stormed his general sanity and carried it and turned all its concerted cannon upon its own mad mark so that far from having lost his strength ahab to that one end did now possess a thousandfold more potency than ever he had sanely brought to bear upon any one reasonable object this is much yet ahab's larger darker deeper part remains unhinted but vain to popularize profundities and all truth is profound winding far down from within the very heart of this spiked hotel de cluny where we here stand however grand and wonderful now quit it and take your way ye nobler sadder souls to those vast roman halls of thermes where far beneath the fantastic towers of man's upper earth his root of grandeur his whole awful essence sits in bearded state an antique buried beneath antiquities and throned on torsos so with a broken throne the great gods mock that captive king so like a caryatid his patient sits upholding on his frozen brow the piled entablatures of ages wind ye down there ye prouder sadder souls question that proud sad king a family likeness ay he did beget ye ye young exiled royalties and from your grim sire only will the old state secret come now in his heart ahab had some glimpse of this namely all my means are sane my motive and my object mad yet without power to kill or change or shun the fact he likewise knew that to mankind he did long dissemble in some sort did still but that thing of his dissembling was only subject to his perceptibility not to his will determinate nevertheless so well did he succeed in that dissembling that when with ivory leg he stepped ashore at last no nantucketer thought him otherwise than but naturally grieved and that to the quick with the terrible casualty which had overtaken him the report of his undeniable delirium at sea was likewise popularly ascribed to a kindred cause and so too all the added moodiness which always afterwards to the very day of sailing in the pequod on the present voyage sat brooding on his brow nor is it so very unlikely that far from distrusting his fitness for another whaling voyage on account of such dark symptoms the calculating people of that prudent isle were inclined to harbour the conceit that for those very reasons he was all the better qualified and set on edge for a pursuit so full of rage and wildness as the bloody hunt of whales gnawed within and scorched without by the infixed unrelenting fangs of some incurable idea such a one could he be found would seem the very man to dart his iron and lift his lance against the most appalling of all brutes or if for any reason thought to be corporeally incapacitated for that yet such a one would seem superlatively competent to cheer and howl on his underlings to the attack but be all this as it may certain it is that with the mad secret of his unabated rage bolted up and keyed in him ahab had purposely sailed upon the present voyage with the one only and all-engrossing object of hunting the white whale had any one of his old acquaintances on shore but half dreamed of what was lurking in him then how soon would their aghast and righteous souls have wrenched the ship from such a fiendish man they were bent on profitable cruises the profit to be counted down in dollars from the mint he was intent on an audacious immitigable and supernatural revenge here then was this grey-headed ungodly old man chasing with curses a job's whale round the world at the head of a crew too chiefly made up of mongrel renegades and castaways and cannibals morally enfeebled also by the incompetence of mere unaided virtue or right-mindedness in starbuck the invulnerable jollity of indifference and recklessness in stubb 
and the pervading mediocrity in flask. Such a crew, so officered, seemed specially picked and packed by some infernal fatality to help him in his monomaniac revenge. How it was that they so aboundingly responded to the old man's ire, by what evil magic their souls were possessed, that at times his hate seemed almost theirs, the white whale as much their insufferable foe as his, how all this came to be, what the white whale was to them, or how to their unconscious understandings also, in some dim, unsuspected way, he might have seemed the gliding great demon of the seas of life, all this to explain would be to dive deeper than Ishmael can go. The subterranean miner that works in us all, how can one tell whither leads his shaft by the ever-shifting muffled sound of his pick? Who does not feel the irresistible arm drag? What skiff in tow of a seventy-four can stand still? For one, I gave myself up to the abandonment of the time and the place, but while yet all a rush to encounter the whale, could see naught in that brute but the deadliest ill. End of chapter 41